Get it, please. So, uh, hello. Uh, again, for those of you who are, uh, have just joined us, uh, my name is Gerald Caden, um, and I welcome you on behalf of the Graduate School of Design. I'm a professor here of urban planning and design, uh, and I welcome you to this uh, conference, which is sponsored by the Graduate School of Design, Urban Planning and Design Department. Uh, and the Dutch Ministry of Infrastructure and the Environment. We're delighted you're here. Uh, that program has now been uh, removed. Uh, and we're going to continue with the second of the seven panels uh, that are scheduled, uh, of which uh, tomorrow we, we have uh, five panels. Uh, the basic uh, routine of the panels is they run for an hour and a half. Uh, each speaker has 20 minutes to speak uh, directly. Uh, followed by 15 minutes of conversation with all of you, uh, and then finally 15 minutes uh, among the panelists. We didn't do that in the last panel because we started a little late, so we privileged our audience discussion. And I think one has to view this as a deepening kind of experience. I had lots of answers that I wanted to give to lots of the questions, and I didn't. Um, I'm going to be, uh, as the conference chair here tomorrow, and I have 15 minutes tomorrow, uh, in which I'll be addressing uh, some of the things that we've raised already. But I think over the entire day and a third, hopefully, we'll get to a lot of these issues and, and deepen our, our engagement with them, because they're so interesting and important, and the fact that you're all here uh, is a testament to that. So without further ado, Blair Kamen. Good evening, uh, I'm Blair Kamen, the Chicago Tribune's architecture critic, and I'm even fellow in journalism this year at Harvard. Our subject uh, tonight, as you know from, our, from your programs, is designing public space, by whom and for whom. If it's axiomatic, as Charles Moore once wrote, that you have to pay for the public life, then the matter of whether public space should be designed, and if so, by whom, is fraught with controversy. Such urban design failures as Boston's City Hall Plaza, with its forbidding moonscape of crumbling brick, have put architects on the defensive. One of our speakers, Fred Kent, has even devised a public space hall of shame that chastises public spaces for variously being self-indulgent, disproportionately scaled, desolate, disconnected from their surroundings, threatening, and absurd. Among these spaces in the Hall of Shame are Bernard Chumi's Park de la Villette, Frank Geary's Plaza at the Guggenheim Bilbao, and the work of two GSD faculty members, Martha Schwartz and Michael Van Valkenburg. Fred, I'm kind of surprised that they let you in here tonight. <laughs> Um, <laughs> others, um, beyond Fred, have even gone so far as to champion DIY, do-it-yourself public spaces that do away with the architect's participation altogether. As you might suspect, professional designers are not ready to be relegated to the sidelines. And we have two of them here tonight, Adrian Kuzo of the Dutch landscape architecture firm West 8, and Jonathan Marvel of Rogers Marvel Architects, to argue the other side, that designers have learned from the profession's past failures and are meaningfully and creatively engaging issues of our day. Indeed, such examples as Chicago's Millennium Park, despite the occasional commercial sign, uh, reveal the power of design spaces that emanate from the top down to attract both hordes of people and critical acclaim. So the following questions may be relevant as we undertake this debate. What exactly is public space? Parks and plazas, or do we need a more expansive definition? What makes public space distinctively public? And how is it distinct from other types of space? Does the digital age augur well or ill for public space? How can public space overcome the impulse to fortify cities in response to the threat of terrorism? In a nation polarized by politics and fragmented by race and class, does public space still retain 
its Olmsteadian capacity to act as a social mixing chamber that simultaneously expresses and facilitates the highest aspirations of a democracy. Each speaker, as Gerald mentioned, will have 20 minutes, followed by questions from you, and then a discussion. Adrian, we'll start with you. Thank you for the introduction. Luckily, I, am, I didn't make it into the public space of shame. <laughs> uh, as a conclusion, I start with a conclusion, I end with the same conclusion. Um, I, would, I, I better kill myself if I, if I won't believe that the good, the good outcome of public space uh, uh, can only be the result of professional uh, designers. And I'm not talking about the suburban uh, countryside realm, but more, let's say, the urban realm. Uh, when I was a student, uh, these things, I, I grew up, um, um, unfortunately, in the 70s, which was the age of um, peace and harmony, and uh, we were all, all together and all these kind of things. Um, and as a young uh, child, you never like, um, let's say, the, the, the paradigm of uh, the people who raise you. So I had a sort of complicated uh, life with that. Um, <clears throat> I think uh, Renaissance and Enlightenment uh, liberated the people and created a window to frame how we deal with each other today. And um, let's, I, I want to show two elements uh, of so when I was a student, which made uh, sense for me, this is a milkmaid in every culture. The milkmaid is the lowest in rank, and Vermeer saw the milkmaid as the ideal girl. So no longer Jesus, Madonna, or the princess, or the queen, uh, a subject of painting, but a girl, girl next door. So this is this is fantastic. That uh, look at this, and uh, that 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 the beauty of the of the of the average. Beauty of the, the ordinary uh, is so intense, and um, I think that is, for for me, this was very uh, relevant when I was a student. Another thing, this is this is my hero, Louis uh, Leroy. He's a Dutch. I don't know what he is, but uh, people call him a landscape architect. And he was he is now he was a hippie. He died unfortunately recently. Um, and um, he was totally uh, hippie, uh, uh, his, he was wired as a hippie, fundamentally. And uh, he started to do public space design with people from crap material. So in, uh, in, uh, this started in suburban uh, realm, where uh, he made a sort of political statement to stop uh, our um, monofunctional public space, and um, we don't need professionals, we don't need maintenance, we don't need uh, bureaucracy. We don't need that, and, um, and uh, <clears throat> he took it uh, on the level of uh, participation which was unprecedented. He only used uh, uh, material for free, um, uh, and um, as we now would call it, uh, recycling uh, on a level which is a uh, uh, crazy good. Uh, uh, as a hippie, uh, his uh, drive was of course a play experiment. Um, improvisation and people helping him uh, to build uh, neighborhoods and parks and public spaces. Uh, they, they did it with no money and uh, with an intense uh, pleasure. And the outcome, um, as I see it, is like spectacular. You know, it is, uh, it is beyond uh, Inca ruin in the jungle. It is, uh, it is beyond uh, what we can ever do. But in, in his later life, because this guy was of course a, a freak and obsessed, he spent his entire day in building, building these eco-cathedrals uh, all alone himself. And um, uh, ecology was, uh, was uh, his main drive. And, uh, and what is so good is that uh, there is a place for decay and um, um, patina. Now, uh, these lessons when we started practice uh, uh, helped a lot. Uh, Let's say, to, how, do, how do we bring project with empathy? So this is an urban plan, you might know, uh, in Amsterdam, Borneo, Spornerberg, in which we more or less fores foresaw the, 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 the option to create uh, for two and a half thousand dwellings, each house, a patio, garden, where people can explore their own uh, you know, in, indoor, outdoor um, 
expressions, and it, and it was very fundamental, has been built, which is uh, remarkable. We, we started a debate about people building their own houses, which is very unfamiliar in those days. In the Netherlands, uh, you cannot go further in uh, expression of, of, of the indiv individual. And uh, so we saw the chance of a, a, a fundamental um, anarchy of the boaters, to, uh, to allow the boaters to create uh, their own uh, uh, parallel world. Um, and, um, <clears throat> and we also really find the, the, the public space, private space um, interface. As you might see, this is, these were things which were then really uh, experimental, uh, but um, uh, this was all caused by this, these lessons of empathy. And, uh, and last but not least, we were not, uh, we did, we were willing to burn our fingers to make iconic uh, totems where uh, children, uh, people, lonely hearts participate on their own way, uh, being excited and um, explore. <coughs> a little later we built an urban scheme where we almost dedicated 80% of the public space, you see the plan, it's also in Amsterdam, into uh, gardens. So we uh, avoided to make public space and uh, again, the interface of the individual and the public space became a fundamental uh, DNA of this neighborhood and it evolved in a sort of hippie enclave, a sort of a new uh, sustainable lifestyle family who occupies the audience um, and lives there. And you also see it in this kind of behavior. They, they almost, uh, they are free state, you, you understand. Or um, recently uh, we, we were working on a project in uh, Porta Bayerla in Mexico on the Pacific Ocean where uh, we had to build in, a, in let's say less than three months an entire project uh, where we uh, 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 could not uh, think about to get on the finish without participation. So we, we bought paintings of, a, of an artist, a witchy uh, Indian artist who then helped us uh, in this painting uh, with all kinds of configuration which we could abstract in the computers, what, what you see here, a catalog. And then uh, this was made by local people in mosaics on the floor, very cheap. This is all very, 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 very cheap public space. But it, it carries the logo of the, of the, of the people uh, who live there. And uh, it sells the ID to Americans and Canadians who are tourists over here, that they are, are welcome in Mexico. They are not here in Barcelona or in, in uh, uh, Rio, Rio de Janeiro. This is not a generic space, it is made by the people themselves. At least that's the illusion, of course it is not true, but that is, let's say, that is the level of uh, where design and empathy work together. Uh, we did experiment in this, one of the earliest projects uh, in the Plaza in Rotterdam uh, with the materialization, which is super poetic, related to the Docklands and a lack of any program. So to have almost a stage as a concept, and uh, which is maybe for a lot of people um, unfair and shocking, and for a lot of people like total freedom uh, to explore, and that is also a level of empathy. And um, and we fantasize even that uh, gigantic lamps, which are beyond a hundred feet high, hydraulic, um, where people uh, gather at night and fool around. Um, can be moved by kids. So here we see a panel where children uh, select a lamp and uh, reposition the lamp or bring the light over the square. And uh, at daytime, this makes a, a strange, surreal uh, mechanical ballet which, which does things to people and uh, triggers, triggers them. And let's say these, these are all uh, early lessons of empathy. Uh, now, I come to um, uh, more fundamental uh, research uh, uh, before my final uh, conclusion. If, uh, if we take uh, three uh, urban projects we work on, or we, we just finished, or almost finished, and we analyze the complexity of those, then, uh, then my conclusion of professional designers is not too bad, I believe. The first one is a project uh, in Miami Beach, um, uh, where we were, uh, designed, we were asked after competition uh, to design a Lincoln Plaza. Uh, Lincoln Square is uh, part of uh, the complex of the um, uh, Newell Symphony uh, and it's Frank Gehry's uh, building, uh, architecture. 
it is a public-private partnership, and the mayor, and this is a city uh, manager, they took enormous risk to t participate in such an undertaking, a project of that scale, uh, with their tax money uh, limitation and democratic implementation is very risky, and it also, um, I, I won't say it cost him his job, but a year later he is no longer in function. <laughs> uh, so, he had, of course, he had, there was collateral damage, and if you're in a political realm, uh, that adds up, and there is a moment it's over. Um, and they, everyone had in mind a wonderful welcome uh, plaza, but the political uh, financial, private partnership, political situation is so complex I cannot even lecture about it. And then there was the prestige of, of uh, people uh, with egos bigger than Jupiter. Uh, <laughs> another project we worked uh, on um, uh, was the Madrid Rio project. We worked in a larger team with uh, colleague architects. Uh, was a, was a, was the, the vision of the mayor, Gaia Don, who could not be elected, uh, it wasn't positioned by his party as a Partido Popular, uh, as potential uh, candidate for being prime minister, and then he took the, the bypass, which is first become mayor of Madrid. But you can become mayor of Madrid if you have a plan. So his plan was to get all the highways under the ground, like the big dig, but then three times the scale of the big dig. Can you imagine? So this was before 2008, but he did, he delivered. So he had a dream. The river of Madrid, the highways will, will go, the park uh, and, and the city will, will, will come over the, over the tunnels and the river. People from either side of the river will meet in the middle. And this is an extraordinary vision for about 15 miles of tunnels. This is fantastically grandiose, uh, Napoleonic, uh, Stalinistic, uh, wild <laughs> and large. And, but, so, I mean, so this is a complex situation, if you analyze politically, also technically, and the scale of, of such an operation. Um, so we needed a, a team of more than 22 people working four years to deliver this. I mean, it gives a certain uh, reality. And the third project I would like to mention is the, um, the, the, the legacy project of uh, Mayor Bloomberg. Uh, he has a remarkable vision to make Governance Island publicly accessible and by making a park it could also uh, um, catalyze development. Um, uh, you might understand that, that, uh, that this is also port authorities, it's historic uh, context. Um, it is through, first through GAIPEC and through a trust. It's very complex realities where we have to deal with. with very responsible uh, work because if you make mistakes, you know, it, it hits back on, on the mayor. Um, so, to consider the context, Miami Beach has an emerging uh, urbanity of uh, Lincoln Road, uh, the Ocean Boulevard, the beach, but, and also the, 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 the Art Basel, the, the, the December event, but all the art world meets each other. And it takes place uh, um, in, a, in an area which could become uh, vital and, uh, and, and interesting urbanity, uh, which is very rare in America. And so, the, the, to make a project, is, it has a lot to do with the context of, of uh, urban design, traffic, how people use the space, where people meet, where overlapping user groups could occur. This is not like making a design, it's first of all understanding the world. And then uh, the, the park uh, or the plaza should be linked uh, with a cultural facility designed by Frank Gehry, the music school. Um, in Madrid, the context is uh, totally beyond imagination. So, the, the Madrid Rio project is a project uh, of a, maybe a, a billion euro public space spending. It's not about pipes, utilities, and tunnels, only the cover. And uh, it could only land such an enormous project in a regional planning scheme, which had to be designed or you know, it had to be invented in which uh, northern and southern territories uh, are linked uh, and connected. Um, uh, the the Madrid Rio project is stunningly complex in its history. So here we see the old Madrid the river, the, the bridge, uh, the, the chapel, the wall, uh, the royal palace. And this is how it, this was the dream of Cayadon, that people enjoy and relax over there. Um, 
chapel, uh, there were this patrimonium, there were a renaissance or baroque uh, gates, they need to be rebuilt after original drawings. There was a 13th century bridge like in Prague, where all the tunnels uh, went under, and there is a, a cultural district born from the slaughtery houses, the Mataderos. The governor's island context is, um, I, I don't go into too much details, it's very complex because it is a, it is a bloody island, you cannot get there. So if you, if you buy a stone, you have to first to truck it, then to ship it, then to truck it. Um, I mean, it's so complex, it's a developing site, five minutes. Uh, his, historic uh, uh, land value of uh, national park, um, uh, Statue of Liberty, you know, everything. Now, what other level come you, you, you realize if you work in this project, and this is, this is uh, today, it is, it is madness to overcome uh, uh, complexity. In Miami Beach, we were hauled by the, by the, by the uh, municipal authorities not to plant vegetation. So we were asked to make a green space with no vegetation. We could not use soja or Bermuda grass. We could not use trees. There was no allowance for flowers because of hurricane and uh, maintenance budgets, which is a, uh, which is a shocking uh, paradox. We needed the help of uh, the director of the botanical gardens. Uh, we needed to team up with him. He is also a lawyer and with a huge network to massage these problems out. And he brought, he was our agent, Vicha, which finally got permission to be planted. This is a tree which uh, resists every storm. And then buying vegetation, because we had to deliver in one year, we had to, uh, more than 50 nurseries were needed to, to plant the park with Vichas. And as you might see this, the guy on the right, these are the sopranos, are nothing with this. Uh, this is where we have to engage and uh, overcome. Uh, and then the planting and the hurricane became a catastrophe. We had to invent a new anchoring system with rebar system underground and, and uh, ties. Um, uh, a pergola, which seems very uh, artistic and funny and easy, could only be built in aluminum. We needed all the engineers in both New York and uh, Philadelphia, Florida to build this in aluminum. It was, we needed to build it and then cut it in pieces and reassemble on the side. You need a lot of craftsmanship and ownership to do that. And then uh, to get uh, acoustic quality, uh, finally we were in the hands of acoustic engineers who brought a sort of carcass of a whale in our park. You will never uh, allow in your design. So we, had, we needed the, the help of Disney to camouflage the whole sound system and beef up speakers and everything in elegant bars which could resist the hurricane. Uh, in Madrid we were uh, building over tunnels. Uh, at the end of the uh, three years building period there was more than 200 subcontractors and it was all temporary and, uh, and very complex uh, business. Uh, at the end of the day also the, the geographical complexity of the tunnels became nerve-breaking. Nerve so we needed styrofoam quantities never seen before. We had a lot of problems with water quality and water levels and to purify and to add ecological knowledge to do something. We introduced grey water because there was not enough water for this park. In Governors Island we had a flood problem. Uh, for, for us uh, this was very serious so we, we really had to engineer the island uh, about flood lines uh, with debris and new topography. And, uh, and this needed to be shipped and uh, uh, Sandy uh, took place and we su it survived Sandy. So it was a good job, but it took us three years. And a mass production of uh, edges and uh, quantities of soil and debris all over, over the water is, it is so complex. We deal today in, in urbanism, specifically in, Eng in England and in America, with the legal issues which are beyond imagination. You, you, can, you would better kill yourself and stop working if you realize what kind of risk you take. And it has to do, you cannot even make a bench because it needs to have a backrest for, for ADA, or it need, you need to develop uh, devices to keep uh, skaters or uh, homeless away. It is very complex. And then we also, we, we realize it should also uh, back drain and all these details need to be specified. And if one thing goes wrong, uh, you hang. And uh, <laughs> if you build a park on top of tunnels, you can, you can imagine what happens if, if there's, but if it, this is so long tunnel, it will start leaking, there's no doubt it will happen. 
and of course they will blame us. <laughs> and uh, Governors Island, we have a, a boat landing. Uh, I stop here. Uh, where uh, trucks arrive, uh, and when uh, when there is a ferry boat in full capacity, thousand people, big children, thousand people, children landing there with trucks and people waiting and bicycling. This is madness. You know, it's waiting for accidents. It's very complex, and of course the the staff will never make uh, the mistake. It would always be the, the layout and the design. So we have responsibilities. Uh, wow. Now, finally, we do this for people, and people benefit from all our knowledge, and hopefully uh, they, they take it for granted and never think about these things. And, and they, they, have a, they have a fantastic evening in uh, Miami. They enjoy uh, Madrid on their bicycles. Hundreds of thousands of people every day. Uh, Salon de Pinos, entrepreneurs uh, have good business in bike rentals. And, um, and people, uh, people go there every day in summer. It is their, their holiday, their uh, workout space, and their enjoyment. Um, we, ha we had the luck for Governors Island to have a client who was totally um, empathic and into anthropological uh, research. Uh, and the free bicycle program uh, uh, is part of a research. And we figured out that people could not even bicycle. And sometimes they bicycle with the whole family, with, with grandma. Four people on one bike, these kind of things, and uh, uh, experiment and art uh, takes place. Um, I come to a conclusion. For a good outcome of public space design, we need professional designers. Thank you. side of this, and that's what I'll try to explain. Uh, we work on uh, public spaces all over the world, and this is just one in uh, Palais Royal in, in uh, Paris that we go to very frequently, and I'm always amazed at the way that people some can connect. And I think that's sort of the whole idea of how and what we're trying to do when we create a place is that we're really trying to help people to connect, to open up, to be part of something bigger than themselves, to be uh, enabled to, to smile, to be affectionate. And uh, when I was at this one uh, a few years ago, uh, these three people were trying to take a picture, and then all of a sudden some other people came along and helped them take the picture. And it's that kind of, I'll help you, that kind of fun that arrives, and the pleasure that everyone gets in it, and then the connection they make. Uh, that we're always trying to figure out is how do you go into a space, how do you kind of relax, how do you become part of something, how do you be part of something with other people. So we have these 11 principles that the community is the expert. You're creating a place, not just the design. Uh, you can't do it alone. They always say it can't be done. Uh, and then going down to, you know, to creating a place-making vision, I'll get into that, the power of 10, triangulation, form supports function, lighter, quicker, cheaper, money is not the issue, and you're never finished. We never use words like urban, uh, because we've, we're dealing with a community, and urban, in some people's minds, is a bad word. I love urban, and I think everything needs to have sort of a move towards an urban kind of place, whether you're in a small town or, or a large city. Uh, we work all over the world. Tomorrow I'm going to uh, Cape Town uh, in South Africa to work on the downtown and the waterfront. Someone else is going to Adelaide, no, no to Auckland next week to work on uh, the waterfront there. Uh, and we come, I think this week someone just got from into, back from Malaysia. Uh, and so we're really all over the world working on uh, the public spaces, doing placemaking, creating uh, uh, campaigns to, to create these a whole series of public spaces to retrofit existing ones and so on. Uh, we have an enormous following. Uh, we have more people following us than CNU, uh, 
uh, more people on Facebook, maybe twice as many people on Facebook as the Urban Land Institute. So this idea of place and place-based strategies of placemaking has become a really big deal. Now NCBW, I'm sure no one knows what that is, but we also run an organization called the National Center for Biking and Walking. And uh, we have about four or 5,000 people that are part of that network. Uh, we have a big partnership with the UN Habitat where we're doing a series of three conferences and we're supposed to reactivate 300 spaces between now and the next four years. And we're developing an agenda with a foundation in uh, Stockholm, Axon Johnson, uh, to build language for Habitat 3 in 2016. Uh, and that first conference is in uh, June. Uh, and then CIRD is another one. It's the Citizens Institute for Rural Design, an NEA program that we run. Uh, and so we're dealing on many levels with broad campaigns, with training and supporting people in communities. And I had the amazing pleasure, and, and uh, Gerald certainly knows all about this, that working with Holly White and what he did, uh, the plan for the city of New York he wrote, and then the social life of smaller urban spaces was when I started working with him. Uh, but he was a great writer, and you could read this. You know, I end in praise of small spaces, and you know, that the number of people using them, the larger number of people who pass by and enjoy them vicariously, or the larger number who feel better about a city center for knowledge of them, for those places are priceless, whatever the cost, they are built a set of basics, and they're right in front of, in front of our noses if we will look. So that's the way we, we sort of go deep into a community, we try to create varieties of places that are defined by the community for themselves so that they own those spaces. Uh, and this is uh, some of his quotes, you know, benches are artifacts, the purpose of which is to occupy, to punctuate architectural photographs. They're not so good for sitting. Uh, there's a lot of that all over the place. When we see one of those, I go kind of apoplectic because it's just another form of egotism that kind of says, I'm going to do the bench that has the most shape and form and it's a spectacular idea. And then in our neighborhood in Brooklyn, we have this bookstore with some rather rudimentary benches, but it is absolutely a destination. Everyone comes there. They slow down. Uh, all kinds of people are, are part of that. The experience, they're smiling. Uh, sometimes you can't get through. We have more three-year-olds in our, in our zip code than any other zip code in, in New York City. And so the biggest problem we have is congestion of strollers, uh, which is a, you know which is not hard, not so bad a problem to have. I have three grandchildren, uh, and then you take a bench like the one on the bottom, the four foot bench, and you realize that only one person will probably sit on each of those. But if you do a nine foot bench, and then maybe you do a double sided bench, all of a sudden you're changing the whole dynamic, and you get a bench like that. And I, I can't remember how many people are sitting on the one on the right, but if you look at all the sort of social uh, networks that are going on and people listening to other people and the connections they make, this is probably, from our point of view, the best bench we've ever seen uh, anywhere uh, in the world. And then another quote is, you know, the best thing about water is the look and feel of it. It's not right to put water before people and then keep them away from it. You better start this thing. <laughs> Gerald, I can't start these things. I don't know how I'm doing time-wise. Anyway. Uh, so, you know, here's a world record of people taking off their shoes and putting feet in the water. But in good places, people take off their shoes. Uh, we see it. As soon as you go into a good place, you absolutely sense it right away. And then you start seeing all these things, affection and shoes off and uh, all kinds of things. And then if you want to see a place with activity, put out food, uh, I love the, the ice cream stand because uh, people get ice cream and then they start eating it together in unison, or the, uh, or the, the uh, fresh fries. So all of this is sort of the social life of a space. Uh, and this is really an absolutely remarkable photograph because this is a world, this is a world record because all of those people are having ice cream except for the little boy. And that never, ever happens any time. That's the first time we've ever seen that. But he also tells us that that's not right. Okay. So you get these kinds of things. And why don't we have better public spaces today? It's fear, uh, the narrow development goals, project-driven versus place-driven, government structures, silo disciplines, design versus place. Uh, communities today are separated and isolated. Uh, uh, the individual institutions are around parking lots and sort of landscaping around the buildings. Uh, and we need to change that so that we get a square and, 
Uh, so what we're saying is we need to turn everything upside down to get it right side up, to get from inadequate to extraordinary. Uh, and placemaking is, an, is a dynamic human function, act of liberation, staking claim, <coughs> of beautification, true human empowerment. And as people get engaged in making a place that they own, that's their part of their community, that they uh, help to implement, you get phenomenal results. So we say it's a sacred community process, it's an organic process, it localizes, it's economic development, it's scaled to each community, it creates social and place capital, outcomes are health and sustainability. Is it design? I think so. Uh, but a very different kind of design, and, and maybe not you know, the other kind of design that we're talking about here is not bad either, but maybe this is what we really need. So we're working in Detroit uh, on the downtown core, uh, and that light green color is where we're spending our time right now to reactivate it. It's mostly been evacuated uh, and denuded of any kind of uh, activity in the buildings and there's no retail. We're also working on the waterfront and Belle Isle, which is a old homestead park, to reactivate those in a very short period of time. Uh, so the big idea that we have to have, we have to have people and products. We have to see them. The buildings themselves, historic buildings, new buildings, are all there. But there's no life in them. Uh, and uh, we need comfort, we need amenities, we need to triangulate uses, we need to have the streets become places. We need to localize through the markets, through local business, through talent, local talent. We think, need to think about architecture beyond iconic, to about how it creates a sense of place. And multi-use destinations, we don't use the word park because we see that there's a whole range of public spaces that can err towards park-like or towards square-like and, and complexes of buildings, but the publicness of them is a critical part of that. It's a very more, much more complicated thing than that. Uh, so we're saying in this group of, of uh, people in Detroit is thinking small in a big way uh, is how we can transform the city and we have a very short period of time to do that. So this is Woodward Avenue. We did the plan for this uh, Campus Marshes uh, Central Square and uh, that's number one and we have to go down to the river and we have to go out to, to a park on the other side and we have to we do uh, Woodward Avenue and then there's some other public spaces and we have a couple of years to do it and to reactivate it. This is Woodward Avenue today, it's mostly empty. Uh, it has 45 foot sidewalks, these are the new buildings. Uh, you can't see the uses, there are some uses in that building, but you can't see them because the architecture is so imposing on you. Uh, this is the same building but on another side there are, there is retail in there but you wouldn't know it because it's the architecture that dominates rather than, the, than uh, the use of the people. So here's a building that this fellow owns that we're working with, Dan Gilbert, who owns Quicken Loans. And this is a space that we're going to uh, retrofit very quickly in, uh, by the summer. Uh, and we used uh, this uh, image from a heritage building in Stockholm where we can put a face on that building and put three levels and build glass. So you, instead of just looking at the columns, and, and thin retail, you can see that all of the uses come out. Uh, we also, uh, and here's a building in Paris where we go very frequently, and that messy part of the bottom of that building uh, is extraordinary when you get up close, and there's a market there uh, three days a week. But as you get closer, uh, look at these uses that are pulled out of that building and activate that whole street. If you tried to take these out and to put some design standards on it, you'd have a mutiny uh, on your hands because this is what brings that whole space alive. Uh, and so is this design, is this architecture, is this architecture a place? I think it is. Uh, and when you go to the department stores, and remember this is for Detroit, we've got to activate, we've got to bring people out on the street, we've got to get them uh, the product out there because we have no retail. Uh, and so, uh, you know, there's the, the, the department stores have uh, the kiosks, uh, we need good corners because we can, st we can move the corners out and we can have uh, uh, almost a square at each, at each intersection because we can do something on the same, same intersection, slow the traffic down, and now you have a square even though there is no square around. Uh, the street is a place. Uh, we're going to do this in front of the building you saw where we're going to take out the street but allow the traffic to be there. Uh, and this is a triple loaded, uh, this is a triple loaded uh, street in Paris and we'll triple load some of the streets uh, in, 
in, in Detroit because we have to use the street as the venue for activity. We don't have the internal retail. And as the retail comes in, we can maybe modify the street, but maybe we won't. Maybe this is the way people want to be. So here's a, a, a rendering of what that could be, or what that will be, because they're actually building the extension on that building. They put a cafe in. We'll extend that cafe out. Uh, as a um, um, Shake Shack is going into one of those buildings. And so there's a series of public spaces that now can become activated. And we don't have the cars blocking the views. And we can do that, and then there's also a similar proposal going down to the river. So the placemaking tools and process that we use, I'll go through these very fast. We talk about the power of 10, where a city needs 10 destinations, uh, great 10 de destinations, and each destination needs 10 places, and each place needs 10 things to do. Uh, so you can go back to the bookstore in our neighborhood, and there are at least 10 things to do uh, at that bookstore. So that bookstore is totally alive. Uh, we're working in New Haven on the New Haven Green, and uh, we've broken it down into something like 20 spaces. The three churches uh, are amazing because you can't believe the different personalities that each of the people in those churches have, and how they have their own idea, but so does everyone else, because every, every circle involves a library or something else that needs to be part of that. I'm sorry about this, because the, what, this is the historic part, it's, it's changed, the uh, orientation has changed. And this is what we call a placemaking plan that is a short, lighter, quicker, cheaper plan, and then we're starting to implement that. And then over time, it'll be uh, modified and improved. Uh, we're doing the same thing here for the plaza uh, in between the, the uh, Science Center and, uh, and uh, uh, Harvard Yard, uh, which is a fascinating project. So uh, Bryant Park, uh, we did the plan for Bryant Park. We also upgraded Rockfall Center back in the 70s because uh, they wanted to put spikes on the ledges there and we put said benches. Uh, and Bryant Park, we replaced the drug dealing with, with economic activity. Uh, so they changed that. And today, these are the destinations that define New York. We also worked on the Port Authority bus terminal uh, and uh, Times Square. But here's what it was like before. Oops. And uh, Times Square, we were working on that uh, prior to uh, our, we had a program that we got rid of the tra traffic commissioner, uh, who was the wife of uh, Senator Schumer. Uh, and uh, we did get rid of her, <laughs> and we put in someone else who's much better. Uh, but one of our people and, and some of our other staff put this plan together where we did these photo images, and then it became this when the uh, new administrator came in. Uh, and Brian Park, we did the plan intimidation and recreation uh, before and after. There's a real story there. Union Square happens to be my favorite one because it's the least uh, overmanaged. Many of these are overmanaged and the flexibility is down and you can't really spontaneously come into them. But this is a place that draws everyone and it, and it kind of is self-managing and it's much more edgy than any of the others that are overmanaged. Uh, and you can do this for a city. This is Singapore. Uh, now, just quickly, Lincoln Center, uh, I think is a marvelous uh, public, public destination, but uh, you kind of ask yourself, well, there's your water feature and your fountain, but what else can you do there? And I think this is a beautiful uh, uh, building, very exclusive, very top-end uh, food, and you can do something on the grass. Uh, and then here you can sit, if they have chairs up there, and you can sit under the trees, but there's really not much else to do until you get the, the Mercedes-Benz uh, fashion Week, uh, I've got a performance, uh, and then you can go out and take pictures of people on stilts. Uh, and, but they have a nice fountain. So, but we're working in Perth, and uh, we did an activation for their cultural district, and uh, this is it, it's right next to the, to the train station. Uh, that's it. And we did this activation plan in 2009, and we went back uh, a year, a little over a year ago, and uh, this is what it was before, and this is what it is today, before, before today, uh, is they brought in many, many uh, layers of uses, and it has become a major destination, the major destination in Western Australia, because it has, I mean, there's tremendous amounts of design in this, but it was all community-led, community-based, community ideas implemented by local people, uh, DIY or whatever you want, and uh, and it's now become the main destination. And when we started out, there were no destinations 
when we went back there, seven, and now. Uh, and so what happened is when we arrived, all these institutions we had their, their arms around their bodies, sort of <laughs> protecting their own institution. And then, uh, and so one of them, we want to turn ourselves inside out of the other center. Uh, our goal is to be poor, sticky, and a wonder. And then the ground floor of the state library, they took all the library functions up and put it on the second floor so that the ground floor became a square. And so uh, the future, <coughs> 42 places with 10 things to do, that even takes it to another level, and then there's a whole development plan that grows out of that. So I'll stop there. responsibility to the um, location and the context of what you are trying to populate in relation to historical context as with the um, Harvard Science Plaza and um, number two um, how much activity um, are you trying to drum up before it becomes um, uh, kitsch or tacky wow. <laughs> we have uh, kitsch or taffy. I, you know, there's such a void. There's such a void in all of Harvard's public spaces. And there was this wonderful program that was done, uh, the Common Spaces program that was done. And then uh, the chairs were put out in Harvard Yard. Uh, and then a couple of a year ago, we worked on a lighter, quicker, cheaper kind of activation effort uh, before it was torn apart. And now we're going back and uh, trying to uh, build, a, uh, engage in what we call a lighter, quicker, cheaper way, a whole bunch of activities. And we've done something like 19 different focus groups and, and placemaking exercises. And we're finding out extraordinary stuff about the population that, uh, of Harvard, but also the community, about what they like to do and what they need. Uh, I, this is a longer conversation, but uh, their finding is that there's so much stress. Harvard students have more stress than any of the other Ivy League schools. And so the, what they're asking for is we need a release. We need a relief. We need to be coming into a place that's very comfortable, that's very calming to us. And in fact, they even recommended having puppy dogs when they come back to school in the fall because that's when they're, they want to, I guess it's connect back to their home. So there's this there's these times of tremendous tension, uh, of release. They're, out they're telling us that they can only spend 10 minutes uh, in a place because they're programmed so heavily all the way through. But if we make it enticing enough, we can draw people in and give them more pleasure. We've broken it down into maybe 20 different places. And, and, uh, uh, the, um, and I should stop because this is too much, can go on much longer. But there's so many things that people want to do in the public spaces, and this is the first one that's being activated. Actually, the community did not know a lot about that at all, and your target groups were like the, the um, bicycle club, et cetera. So, I mean, yes, we can, well, go, no, no, on no. we can go on yeah. about that. Yeah, it's a much longer I conversation. Think, I think that, that um, um, uh, your responsibility was missed. Um, it's just beginning. It's just beginning. I think there was a great puppy dog in Bill Battle that the <laughs> okay, another question? Yes. The, uh, oh, that's fine. Right, if you want to go, and then we'll get to you in the first round. Please. Okay, uh, it's a quick question for Adrian. Uh, you started out with uh, Louis Lador, right? Uh, simple uh, kind of DIY. And then you ended up with Large and Complex. What's the connection there? I ended up with both complex. Large and Complex. Now the, 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 the Roa is my hero, but we work in a, in a for example, if Mayor Gallardon of Madrid wants to be elected as a mayor and has in, in mind to take away every highway in the city and build 100 plus subway stations, this is his, his vision, we work for these people, they are democratically elected, they are clients and we're going to help them. So the reality is that we have to do our job. This is not an easy uh, thing, as you might know. 
And therefore, I think it is fair to say uh, that the sort of uh, 70s reality is uh, super sexy and attractive. It is naive and uh, maybe even beautiful. But uh, Mayor Gayadon is not helped with that attitude. He needs more and better and professional. And, you know, and that's, that enormous sum is what we are doing as officers. And uh, we, we, we learned our lessons. Of course, you know, when I was in school, I had to read the books of uh, Jane Jacobs. And, and, uh, and it was not a burden. It was really helpful. So we know what we are doing. And we are not perfect. But, uh, but, but, but it is not like, uh, you know, there's five recipes and you follow them. And then you have a design and you have Brian Park. That is not uh, the case everywhere in the world and every site and every condition. It's not like that. You need more tools. Okay, so uh, my question follows up to that, and it's uh, the three of you uh, have spoken about uh, the design of public space as a negotiation of different kinds. So one might be of a political space and the kind of aspirations that uh, those funding you for the project might have. Another might be of different transport systems and the kind of conflicts which might emerge there. And I'm wondering, uh, in your own view, uh, can public space be one which negotiates? also embedded social conflicts like race and conflict, which uh, race and class, which Blair uh, mentioned. Uh, and if so, what do you see the role of uh, designers and maybe civil society organizations which are uh, charged with uh, the act of design? All right, I get, I get this one. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. So, can, can public space be the, be the negotiating fulcrum for different users that maybe have different interests for that limited amount of space. Is that more or less? Uh, right? Less about use and more about conflicting social identities. Uh, I mean, the image that you showed started out with a very charged kind of uh, economic and social condition in a time and place. But most of the projects that you guys have shown have been very glossy objects that we can consume through magazines or as kind of recreational users. But I'm wondering, can it address the condition you began with? I think, I, you know, this, public spaces need to be designed for everybody. There, you can't just have one community in mind. I think that there needs to be an, an adaptable flexibility about public space so that there's no ownership. I think so many of the top spaces in Manhattan, for example, are really limited in, in how they can be used. They're, they're largely cafe table type of format. There's no, the, the example of Union Square is one of the best examples for something that is adaptable, that has some flexibility, that they can respond to the different types of social strata that might be wanting to be there. You've got the skateboarders, you can have your political speeches, provided you file it in like you gave for over 75 people or something like that. So the, the, I think the key is that, that public space bring it, the, the key thing is, is it provides space time for people. You, it's, a, it's a chance to, to mingle. You know, the, the heart of Central Park's idea was that all the social strata would be able to occupy there that, and, and promenade there in, in, in the outdoors. It was the, it was the great melting pot for the city. And I think that, that is, that's, that's what public spaces do. They celebrate our, our coming together and shouldn't be restricted. Uh, Fred, I just said, well, Union Square is a very is not really heavily managed. It is it manages itself, and there's sort of this unspoken respect uh, in that space that allows people to come in and, and occupy it, and and it stretches the imagination as to what uh, can happen in it and what you can do in it, and that's a very very important part of a public space. Most of the designs that, that we saw are very controlling. Uh, I would say privatizing, and they limit that kind of magical interaction. There's nothing more pleasurable than coming into a place and feeling and watching everyone come in and feel like they can be part of that in a comfortable, engaging way. That does not happen in many places, and that's what we're trying to do here at the at the, at the science plaza. And and I, frankly, we're also going to be working on Harvard Square. But, uh, but I, would, I, would, I would actually counter that by saying that Union Square is designed 
You're just not noticing it. It's like you're fish in the water. You don't see it, right? But the but it is an, it's a perfect amphitheater. It's subtle, but it works. And that's by design. Everything. Nobody everybody everything is, right? is designed. Of course. Everything is designed. Right. So but some designs limit and control. Other designs allow and, and, and expand people's uh, opportunities. Big difference between those. Avery probably can answer that. So I'm interested in this concept of uh, stewardship and uh, how that factors into the design, but also with public space, to what extent is stewardship uh, necessary to make this public space come alive, and to what extent is that run by the public side, like the city runs thing, events or things, or versus the commercial side, like when Shake Shack makes Madison Square Park come alive. That's okay. Uh, I love that question. Uh, we're we're working in uh, in, this, in Nairobi in the Kibera <coughs> Slum, and uh, the, we and in Rio, and we have found the best organized public spaces are in the slums, where it's self-organized by people, and those are spectacular. And we come into the into the organized parts of cities, the, the plazas in in uh, New York, and everything is controlled, and there's no organic possibilities. It's you have to feel like, you don't feel, you feel alien to it. So if you take those two extremes, I would rather be in the Cabrera slums in public spaces, because that's where you get the most incredible experiences. Life is, a, it's full of life. And we kind of take life out of places, and what we need to do is bring life back into them. And over-design is the biggest destructive force in that process. Hi, um, I'm Linda Jonash. I'm with the Rose Kennedy Greenway Conservancy in Boston. So uh, we've heard a lot of New York-centric conversation, and just maybe to bring it back home a little bit. Um, and trying to connect the dots between the first workshop about the public-private partnership and that model, which is what we have as a conservancy, and the difficulty of raising money and engaging um, private interests and in wanting to do things combined with um, placemaking and, and the small gestures and all of that is what really makes the space come alive as opposed to the big broad sweeping a new fountain, a new park pavilion or whatnot, which is what people are looking to contribute money which then underwrites the operating costs. I, I'm trying to frame this as a question, it's that balance between the big gestures and the small gestures but then pulling in um, the, the private money to underwrite the cost of the, the small gestures and if you come across that in terms of what that balance, uh, if it's effective or not. I, I, I want to just tie that in with the very first question, which was how do you, how, how do you define public space? Because I think, I, I think I, I see it as some broader shoulders than just parks and, and amenities to support activities in those, in, in, our, in, in those areas. I see it as a place to get people outside of themselves. I think inherently human nature, we're self-centered, a public, a vibrant public space is going to pull, it's going to draw you out into the open to engage and interact with the environment around you, whether it's in a national park or in a cathedral-like environment that's like, you know, wow, a wow moment. It doesn't have to have product and food, right? It can be just a serene moment. And I think that that's why you can design some big moves that, that are, that are all inspiring. I think that we miss out on that sometimes if we if we if we we've got to look at all those different levels right? and and so getting outside. But that definition is an all to be a public space. I mean, Rep Collins would call it Absolutely. junk space. Well, there's the mausoleum, and you know the, the museums and malls are kind of blurring the boundaries when when you look at how they engage people and they they use the same retail. So you consider a mall a public space? I mean, absolutely, a mall is a public space. Resident. Well, can I answer your question? Sure. <laughs> see, I didn't want to get off the hook. No, come on. Well, answer mine back first. To that. I want to back that that you, were, you see, the way we would say is do the wire quicker, cheaper. Figure out where the key destinations are along the Rose Kennedy Greenway. Do some small scale improvements. Build up to the point where you really know what you want. And then people are behind you, and they can then hire him or, or him to actually do and fulfill that larger idea. But it's starting where you begin, you don't know what you're going to end up with. And enjoy that. 
build, agenda, build an agenda around it, and then all of a sudden it'll start to, to explode. That's what we're doing over here in the science closet. We're starting with the small scale things, and we know there's going to be some big design issues that we'll get to, and then we'll bring in the designers that can handle that. Fred, I, have, I, I want you to come back to the Mall of Public Space. I also would like you to discuss the wonderful example of the Secret Plaza in New York, which was designed by, as we know, Louise yes. Van Roo and Philip Johnson. Was it an accident that a professional designer created a great public space? <laughs> well, no, wait a minute. you know what happens when I put the art in the middle? We, I studied that. I was, I was one of the people with Polly. We studied that endlessly. And, and the, you know, the people, we looked where the kissing was. It wasn't in the back, it was in the front. Uh, we... Me's like, me's like kissing, I know. Yeah, we sure did. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, but, you know, when you go to the fountain, is, is so, the water feature is so close, you're not allowed, they actually designed it so you couldn't walk. You had to climb up onto the ledge and go along. Well, people would go out there and do that. So despite the design, it could work. When, when we looked at the cross, uh, flow of it, no one went and stopped in the middle. Whenever, when someone did, it was an unusual event. It was like a, you know, this is this never happens. But when you put some, uh, some art out there, all of a sudden it changes the whole dynamic. And the edges were great, and the, the fact that the level was just right for people to, to uh, sit, and the stairs, I mean, there's a whole, I mean, you could go, it's a wonderful place to look at. And it's great, you see, and that does create the setting for activity. Uh, but then if you if you bring in, like if you, I always wanted a cafe back in the corners, which would have brought a lot more people to the back, and it would have been around the water. But when we met with Philip Johnson, he didn't want any, he didn't really want anyone to be there. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, I'd like to thank the panelists and Professor Caden for organizing this, and I think he has something else to say, but please give him your thanks to the panelists.